Um, so I'd like to first thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, what I want to do during this hour is sort of show you guys an application of tensors, okay? So in particular, I want to look at an uh, application of secant varieties in statistics and show that how understanding the geometry, geometry of these secant varieties can give us a way to make headway on a particular statistical problem, okay? So there's many applications um, of tensors to statistics, and so I'm just going to go over one. And so in particular, I'm going to talk about mixture models and their connections to secant varieties and a particular application to evolutionary biology. Um, so one of the things I'm going to throw around a lot is um, the word statistical model. So let's first define what we mean by a statistical model. So our models are going to be discrete. And what, when we say a statistical model, it's going to be a subset of the probability simplex. So a statistical model, which we're going to refer to as sort of math cal m, is a subset, or I should say is a collection of probability distributions. And so I'm going to have to figure out how low I can go here. Um, but we think about it as a subset of basically um, the n minus 1 dimensional simplex, or what we call the probability simplex. And so I'm just going to define this as the set of all points in uh, p to the n, right? where all the entries are uh, I'm sorry, so this is going to be a point in R to the N where all the entries are real, greater than zero, and that they sum up to one. Okay. This is the definition to be a discrete probability distribution, right? And the simplex is going to be the collection of all those probability distributions when my state space has size n, and then our model is going to be a subset of that. So the picture that you guys should always have in mind, right, is, so if I'm in three dimensions. What's the difference between capital N and small n? Uh, did I write small n yet? Yes, you did. Oh, I did. This should be capital N. And actually, I sort of, I'm off by one, too. Okay. So that's very good. All right, thank you. All right, so this is going to be our probability simplex, and then our model is some sort of subset of that, okay? So this might be our M, okay? This is a set of all probability distributions, and that's our model. And in general, our model is going to be a semi-algebraic set, okay? And we're going to work in the case where we're going to think about this P not as a vector, but as a tensor, okay? So I'm going to have and m random variables. So I'm going to let x1 to xm be random variables. Um, with state spaces c1 up to cm. Okay, so this is just, right, one, two, three, up to C, one, and I'm using that bracket notation. Um, and then we're going to think about, so P is going to be an element of R to the C1, dot, 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 times R to the CM, okay? So I'm thinking about it as a, as an array, right, which is C1 times C2, dot, 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 times CM, and then P I1, I2, up to Im is going to be the joint probability of, for this distribution, okay? So this is going to be the probability, this is going to be the probability that x1 is equal to I1, x2 is equal to 
the I2, etc. Okay, and so we're going to sort of think about P as a tensor, and I'll call it a probability tensor. And then we can ask all sorts of questions like that. So if I'm like in a discrete setting, one of the things I can ask about is maximum likelihood estimation and to figure out the maximum likelihood degree under certain models. And so this is a problem that, say, Jose Rod Rodriguez looks at. Um, and so we're going to look at it in a different way. What we're going to think about is we have this model, and we're going to take the algebraic closure of the model. And the idea is that the geometric information about the closure of our model, which is going to be an algebraic variety, is going to give us statistically relevant information. And we're going to use that information. Okay, and so sort of the first example that we always see and that you guys have seen a lot, but not in this setting, is the independence model. Um, and so I want to let x1 and x2 be random variables. And so we say that x1 is independent of x2. So this is the notation that I'm using for independence. Um, if and only if, for all i and j, with i not equal to j, we have this relation. So this is something that you're going to remember from when you first took, stick, took statistics, right? That the uh, two random variables are independent if and only if. Right? Their joint distribution is a product of their marginals. And so let's write that out. So the probability that x1 is equal to i and x2 is equal to j is equal to the probability that x1 equals i times the probability that x2 equals j. And I can rewrite this, right? So I have a notation. I have an indeterminate for that. So if I'm thinking about P as sort of a tensor of unknowns, I can write this as Pij. And then I'm going to use this short, um, shorthand script for the marginals. So this is going to be where I sum over all the j's, and here I sum over all the i's. Okay. And so now this gives us a relationship that we might be familiar with, right? Um, so basically, I can say yes, this model, the independence model, okay, is the set of all probability distributions. Okay, and in this case, our probability distribution is going to be a matrix. We are going to represent in terms of a matrix. So all probability distributions that satisfy <coughs> right, these binomial equations, Pij times Pkl um, minus Pil Pkj is equal to zero. Okay. So we have these binomial relationships that are defining our model. So what is this, right? We've seen this before. This is the segre variety, OK? And so this is going to be sort of the building block of what we're going to be working with, OK? So basically, to sum this up, right, if we take the independence model and we close it, um, this is going to be the set of rank one matrices Rank one, what C one cross C two matrices, okay? And we feel very, fam you know, we feel very familiar with this variety, right? If we take the projectivization, it's the segre. Okay, and it's the 
product of PC1 minus 1 times P. Okay, so now what we're going to do is now that we have a model, we can sort of take mixtures of models, okay? And so I'm going to take these as my building blocks, and I'm going to combine them. And then we're going to see what, what happens. Okay, so now let's introduce a mixture model. Okay, so we're going to let M1 and M2 be two statistical models. Um, and we're going to assume that they're algebraic, uh, semi-algebraic sets. So, assume M1 and M2. And that's going to make everything work very nicely for us. So the mixture of M1 and M2, right, I'm going to just take the set of all convex combinations of, pro of probability distribution in here and a probability distribution in here. So it's going to look like this. It'll look like lambda p plus 1 minus lambda q, right, such that p is in our first model, q is in our second model, and lambda is between 0 and 1. So again, this should give you reminiscent of the sort of the things that we've been talking about, okay? Um, if we were you know, in sort of geometry world, right? This should remind you of the join a little bit, except the difference is I'm taking a convex combination, all right? This is something that you should have in your head. Um, and we can define mixtures. Of a model with itself. Okay, and just so we're all on the same page with notation, I'm going to call the first mixture model of a model is just going to be itself, okay? And then the arth mixture is where I take the arth minus, minus one mixture with M. Okay, and then we can also write this out explicitly. So the arth, arth mixture of M is going to be the set of all probability distributions that rise as the sum in this way. Okay, where I have a lambda i for all r, and this upper index is just going to mean that I'm taking a probable, uh, I have to way to say that I'm taking the i-th probability distribution. <coughs> so each of the p upper index i's are in our model, and lambda is in the r minus 1 dimensional simplex. All right, and there's several different canonical examples of mixture models, okay? So I've written this out. You can, hopefully you guys can all guess where I'm going, right? I'm going to secant varieties, but we'll get there. Um, so there's a couple of canonical examples of mixture models in the literature. Okay, so the first example is if I wanted to take a mixture of binomials. And the way that you can think about this is, okay, I'm a gambler and I like to cheat. And I have two coins, right? I have a coin that's weighted fairly and I have another coin that's biased, okay? And I might have them up my sleeve. And then what I'm going to do is I might take one of them out with probability lambda, lambda, flip it four times, and then if I'm lucky, maybe I get all heads and I win a bunch of money, okay? So that's the very first canonical example of a mixture model, and that's the mixture of two binomial distributions. Um, there's a couple of other examples of mixture models. Um, so those of you who were here last week on Friday, there were a couple of people that talked about mixtures of Gaussians, right? That, came, that was a theme that came up a lot. Um, that's sort of outside of this context because we're working with discrete models. But there was another model. There was this topic model, right? I don't know if you guys remember, but this tree, claw tree, is going to come up again. 
that you're sort of representing it like that. Okay? And that is actually related to the type of mixture models that we're going to be looking at. So our first example of a mixture model, right, is what if I take the mixture of a bunch of independence models? What happens? We look at the mixture model. I'll take the Arth mixture model of the independence model, and instead of right, instead of doing two random variables, I could have done more. I could have done three random variables or four, etc. Right? They would just given me a different segue. Everyone agree with that? Okay. So if I take the mixture model of a independence model this way. This is going to consist of all probability distributions. Or I've been calling them tensors, right? Probability tensors. Of non negative rank. less than or equal to R, okay? And we have the non-negative, right, because these are all, these are all probability distributions, all their entries are above zero, okay? And so we can ask a bunch of questions about these sort of mixture models and these non-negative rank models, and so this is sort of work that Kaya Kubas works on and Alina Robiva work on, right? And in there, they want to keep, keep this non-negativity. Okay, and what we're going to look at, we're going to take the algebraic closure, and so we're going to lose this non-negativity. But I do want to emphasize that there's a lot of interesting geometric questions to be asked just in this setting. Okay, and so we have this proposition, um, and the source that I'm going to cite for this is um, the Green Book on the lectures of lectures on algebraic statistics by Durton's um, Solvent and Strumfelds. Um, but you guys can sort of, as an exercise, prove this by yourself. It's going to be, you know, a two-line proof. So if M is a semi-algebraic set, then we have that the arth secant of sort of the closure of the model, the Zariski closure of the model, <coughs> is equal to if I take the rth mixture of the model and then close it. Okay? So then that's what this is basically telling me is this rth, oh, we're in my example. So if I take the rth um, mixture model here and I close it, right, what I'm going to get is the rth secant variety. Okay? intersected with the simplex, do yeah. I get back the probability tensors? I, Vern is shaking his head no. I don't think you do. I think something weird happens, and I think this is actually sort of investigated further in sort of the green book on the lectures on algebraic statistics. But you can see that actually that won't be the case. It could be that there's, there's risk in closures all space. Your model's not all space. That can happen a lot, right? So in particular, so if I take this proposition and apply it to my example, right? So in particular, if I 
take this mixture, right, which is sort of my favorite example for this talk. C1 minus 1, minus 1, etc. Okay, and what is this? This is a set of all C1 dot 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 cross CM tensors of border rank. And I sort of missed Mike's talk earlier yesterday. I don't know if anyone got into border rank. But what happens is, so when we're dealing with matrices, right, and we take the rank of a matrix, right, if I look at all matrices, all n by n matrices with rank less than r, right, that's an algebraically closed set. But when I go to tensors and I look at all tensors, with rank less than or equal to r, that's no longer algebraically closed, OK? And so you can just think about this border rank as us taking the closure. Okay. And also, and also just so we can recall, you know, the rank of a tensor is the minimum number of rank 1 tensors that I can write it as. And so the main idea or at least the idea for the application that I'm going to show, and sort of this is a recurring theme in algebraic statistics, is that vanishing polynomials on this closure of M, which I'm going to refer to as a model variety, I shouldn't even say can. I'm going to say they give us statistically relevant information. Okay. So I might be talking with a bunch of statisticians, and they're going to be saying, OK, well, you're taking the algebraic closure of everything over the complex field. Why are you doing that? I'm a statistician. I only care about things that you know, are real and positive. right? And we're going to say, oh, it's OK. This geometry is still going to give us information that we can use. And so the application that I want to look at comes from evolutionary biology. And it's going to be modeling phylogenetic trees. So in this application, right, we have DNA from a bunch of different species. So we're going to assume that's aligned in some sort of way. We're going to make a couple of assumptions on our data. Uh, the first one, of course, being that is aligned. Um, the second one, that we have site independence. Um, and what we want to do is taking these DNA sequences, we want, OK, so our goal is given aligned DNA sequences for n species, right? Find the tree. <clears throat> that best describes their ancestral history. So maybe if 
I was fitting this data, I might find like this, where gorilla, human, and ship. Okay, and so this problem, right? This is this problem is called phylogenetic re tree reconstruction, and there's several ways that you can do this. Okay, there's distance-based methods as well, but we're going to look at sort of the statistical way to do this. And the statistical way in phylogenetic tree reconstruction, you are going to put a statistical model on the process. Okay, and then we're going to look at it from this model um, view. So do you know ahead of time how many nodes you want to have in the tree? Yes, you do. So that's going to be your number of living living species that you have data from. Will be your number of leaves. Yeah, so that's number of leaves. But <gasps> oh. Don't have nodes in, the tree. Um, in the general case, no. Um, but you might make some assumptions. Like the assumption that we're going to make is that we're in a trivalent tree, right? So that um, each of the interior nodes only has degree three. Okay. But you can make some simplifying assumptions like that. Okay. And depending on what assumptions you make, your methods may be different. <coughs> and so what we're going to do, right, we have like some tree. Um, we assume that we actually know the tree in this. Um, when I'm describing the model, I'm describing the model with the tree. Okay? And so... And each tree will give rise to its own model. Okay. So we're going to assume that evolution proceeds. Along a tree. According to a Markov process, okay. And so, basically, these these interior nodes, there are hidden nodes. They correspond to extinct species or species that we can't measure, and the leaves are going to correspond to extant or living nodes. I mean, living species. And then we're assuming that evolution is proceeding along, and that there's so according on each of these edges, I have a matrix associated to it. And that's my probability trans transition matrix, okay? And that's going to be the probability, right? This is going to tell me the probability that if I observe, for example, at A here, right, that I'm going to observe at A here, and etc. Okay, so if I'm modeling this in regards to like the four um, nucleic, uh, the four nucleotides, right, this would be a four by four matrix. And so one of the ways, so what we want to do is we have all this data and we want to infer the tree topology. So there's one way to do this that uses algebraic methods. Um, and let me describe this a little bit. So each of these models, right, I, I have a statistical model as some subset of the probability simplex um, is a semi-algebraic set. I can take its closure, right, and it forms a variety, okay? And I get a variety for each of these trees, right? So if I want to do model selection, and in model selection I mean select the tree, you know, infer the tree topology, what can I do? Well, I can take my data, which is going to be this, which is the frequency. Uh, you know, I'm going to have some set of how often I observe A's and so forth. And that's going to give me a data point. Okay? It's not going to lie on any of those varieties a priori, right? because there's some sort of noise in the data. But what I can do is I can find the variety that that data point is closest to. Okay? And then once I find the variety that that data point is closest to, that's going to tell me my tree topology. Okay? And so that's the underlying idea. So these algebraic methods, um, they're basically going to use the defining ideal of the model variety. 
Okay, so, and in this literature, this would be called the phylogenetic ideal. And these methods were first pr proposed in like 1987, and so there was, um, they were proposed in two papers in, independently, in the first by Kevinder and Felsenstein, and the other by Lake. And when they first did these methods, right, what they did was they had sort of this, you know, a, they didn't have the full generating set, but they had the linear polynomials from the generating set. And so they tried this method just using the linear polynomials, right? The polynomials of degree one. And when they did that, they found that uh, it didn't work very well, okay? And I believe that's what Lake had done. And so in 2006, Marta Castanellas and Jesus Fernandez Sanchez tried this again, right? But using the full set of invariances. And these are for some particular models where the invariants are very well understood and easy to write down. And they found that actually it performed as well as other methods in, um, in a variety of cases. And so that gave hope that there might actually be, um, I mean, that gave hope that these algebraic methods might actually work very well. Okay, so now, right, I sort of started off this talk talking about secant varieties. Now I just find a model which is not necessarily a secant variety, but let's get back to that. Let me, and let me explain the relationship now. The, um, depending on sort of the structure that you put on these transition matrices, you'll get different models. And so the model that we're going to look at is the general Markov model. Okay, and I'm sort of going to illustrate this through example. Okay, so let's do the R state. Um, I'll abbreviate this, GMM, on the claw tree, K13. So I thankfully Hero sort of introduced this notation for me, right? So this is the bipartite graph where I have one node and then three. Okay, so our tree is going to look like this. Okay, and then remember for each edge, right, I have a matrix. And each of these matrices, right, they have this form. So if I write out the matrix M1, I'm not going to write out the whole matrix, but the ith jth entry is going to look like this. It's going to look like the probability that X1 is equal to I, given that Y is equal to J. This one is coming from the fact that I'm looking at this M1 matrix. Okay, so that's what the ith j oh, ith j entry looks like, and then y is a hidden variable. with like distribution pi. Now we have r states, so it'll be pi one up to pi r. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to write the probability, so P, J, K, L. So the probability that X1 equals J, um, that X2 equals K, and X3 equals L. And we'll see what we get. And so now this should sort of remind you of sort of these latent variable models that people were drawing last week. I didn't really get into. So now you guys are, are sort of fleshing out the details of this model, right? Right. So then, we have the following. So if I were to write P, J, K, L, right? That's the prob. Um, this is the probability that X one is equal to J, X two is equal to K, X three is equal to L. I have to sum over all possible states of this hidden variable. Okay. And so I'm going to get something like this. Right. So, so for example, if y is in state one, right, 
then the probability that I will say see JKL is going to look like the probability that, or let's say if y is in state i, okay, then it's the probability that y is in state i times the probability that I move from i to j, okay, times the probability that I see k in the second, um, k for the second random variable given that I start at i, and then et cetera. Okay. And so, all right, so this looks like something, right, that we know and love, okay? This looks like our add tensor with rank less than or equal to r, okay? So the probability tensor is an R by R by R matrix. Oh, sorry, not matrix. We'll be beyond that. Okay. Okay, is an R by R by R tensor with rank less than or equal to R. Okay. And so, in fact, this general Markov model is our mixture model, okay? So, in fact, the general Markov model on K13 um, for R states is the same family of distributions with three independent random variables. Okay, where each of the random variables can take one of our states. Okay, so we just, right, we started off with this independence model, we looked at mixture models, and now I'm showing, okay, in this application, right, what we're dealing with are these mixture models. So, so there's these a uh, couple of nice theorems that says that no matter what our tree is, if we want to understand the phylogenetic invariants, right, which are basically the generating set of the defining ideal of this model variety, then all we need to understand are these claw trees, okay? And so, in fact, if I'm just looking at trivalent trees or bifurcating trees, then all I need to understand is this three-leaf claw tree. And then I, I know all my invariants, okay? And so this is actually a theorem due to Alman and Rhodes, and then it was generalized by Dreisman and Cutler. So, okay, so if we be a trivalent tree. And variants <coughs> or T. Okay, and so when I say invariants, right, you're thinking about generating polynomials, um, can be attained. From the invariants or the general Markov model on K13 and minors of matrices <coughs> obtained by tree splits. Okay, and I just want to show an example of how you get these minors of matrices for tree splits because I believe it is one of the problems on the problem set. So 
what do you mean by invariance of so by uh, invariance is a poor choice of words, but it's become sort of canonical in literature. So the invariants are going to be the, gen the generator and polynomials of our ideal. Yeah. Okay, so here's an interesting question. Okay, so if I just have two states, right? If each of my random variables can have two states, then what are my invariants? What are my defining polynomials, right? If I just have two states, then I'm looking at the set of two by two by two tensors with rank less than or equal to two, all right? And we know something about that, right? We know that the generic rank of two by two by two tensors is two, right? Okay, so that means that it fills up the whole space. And so I'm not going to get any invariance from this clock tree. So I'm just going to get these invariances from these minors of matrices that come from these splits. Okay. So let's see an example of how, and this gives you a nice example because then all you're caring about is the tree splits and you get to do these fun things with the um, flat means. So this is sort of an example, but also a theorem. Okay, so if we let T be a trivalent T, trivalent tree with N leaves, okay, the model ideal for the general Markov model on uh, with binary states. Okay, that means everything, my y and all my x's can only be zeros or ones. Um, and it's generating set. I take the union over all valid splits. And so I'll explain what a valid split is a second. And then I take the three by three minors. Of the flattening that I get according to that split. I'll do an example. So now in order to understand, so now these phylogenetic invariants, right, they're just three by three minors. So let me draw a tree here. So let's say I have this tree I'm bifurcating. I believe this tree came up before my talk too. Um, so a balance split is a bipartition of the leaves such that the induced trees which only denote, denote T restricted to A and T restricted to B do not intersect. Okay, so a valid split here. Okay, so what would be a valid split there? If I take one, two, and three, four, and then a not valid, right? Because if I look at the trees induced by one, two, I get this one, and the tree induced by three, four is going to be that one. So a not valid view would be like one, three, and two, four. Yeah, you take the leaves and then you go up and you find their most common parents. How about the split one, comma, two, three, four? Um, 
Um, and that would be a oh, that would be a valid split. But okay, so that would be a valid split. Um, and but we won't get any generators from that split. Okay, and then when we take the flattening in regards to the split, so what I mean by that, right, is, so if I take this split, one, two, so let's just do an example. Okay, I'm going to sort of unfold my tensor until it's a matrix, and what I want to do, um, the way that I can think about this is, okay, I, I write down all the entries that can be for 1, 2, right? So in the 1, 2 entries of P, I, J, K, L, right? I can have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And then I do the same things. Do the same thing for the columns, and then so this entry right would be P0000. This one would be P0001. Okay. Okay. And so that's sort of an interesting example with the flat means, and like I said, they come up in the problem set. Okay, so this is when we have binary states. The other relevant, um, so there's two sort of. Um, there's two cases that are relevant when we're thinking about biology. They're when all the random variables have two states or when all the random variables have four states, okay? And so we can ask about this question, right? So we have this nice theorem, right, that says, okay, we can understand these phylogenetic invariants as long as I understand this claw tree, okay? And so we can ask this question, um, um, what are the invariants when we're looking at at the general Markov model when every state, um, when every random variable has four states. Okay, so, so what about the general Markov model on K13 when each random variable has four states? Okay, and so that is what are the generators of the ideal defining hope? Oh. secant variety of P3 cross P3 cross P3. Okay. So these had sort of come up, I think, in Landsberg's class as well. Um, so this question is actually, to find the generators of this ideal, I think it's still open, as far as I know. Okay, so it's still open, but we do have a set theoretic description of this ideal, okay? Okay, and so I'm going to list a long list of people here because this is sort of like a culmination of a bunch of work. It sort of got pieced off piece, um, bit by bit. But there is a set, set theoretical description of this secant variety. And so I can't write out the polynomials for you, but I can tell you the degrees of the polynomials. Okay, so the set of tensors is these are in 64 variables. These are in 64 variables. Yes. And so like some of these um, 
some of these polynomials, like the degree six polynomials, I believe they have like on the order of 500 and 900 terms. Okay, so these are big. <laughs> All right, so the set of tensors of, oh, I. Okay, so the set of four by four by four tensors of border rank at most four is cut out by a polynomials of degree five, six, and nine. And so I sort of want to just take you know, one moment to sort of talk about this because I think this is a nice confluence of symbolic and numerical methods, okay? Um, so this actually, so I, this, this problem sort of became popular by Elizabeth Allman, right, who's I think proposed it in 2007 and said if anyone can come up with these, this um, idea, the generators of this ideal, I'll go out to my backyard and I'll catch you a salmon, right? And this is how it's become known as the salmon conjecture. Um, and so there were a couple, the original conjecture said that this set was cut out by polynomials of degree five and nine. And, oh, did I, degree five and nine. And so the degree five equations um, first sort of come from Strassen and then they were independently um, refound by Almond and Rhodes. And then Landsberg and Malmville have this two paper from 2004 where they found these degree six equations, okay? And that they knew that these had to be then in that die ideal. Okay, so that brings us here. And then Schmiel Friedland, he was able to prove that basically this variety was defined set theoretically by polynomials of degree five, nine, and he couldn't use the six, but he was able to use 16, okay? So we're getting even closer, right? But there's still this question, right? We knew that the degree six polynomials had to be there. And then in fact, so there's this work by Dan Bates and Luke Oding, right, who actually show that actually set theoretically, it is degree five, degree six, and degree nine, and they use Bertini to show this, okay? And so then, you know, you're almost there, right? And then we just put the rest of it together and we were able to take sort of Friedland's result, right, with the degree 16 and replace this with the degree six, okay? And so this sort of, so even though we don't have an ideal theoretic um, description of, um, this phylogenetic ideal, we actually have enough polynomials that if we actually wanted to use them in practice that we could. Now the problem is, is how do you use these in practice, right? I just told you that they're polynomials that have like 500 and 900 terms. They're ridiculous, right? And so one of these questions and one of the things that I'm bringing you as a plea, right, is that we have all this nice theory, right? We have this nice theory in algebraic statistics and algebraic geometry, um, and there's applications out there. And so how can we start thinking about how to bridge the divide between the theory and the applications, right? Um, and yeah, and so I think this is sort of the right community to do that in. So I've shown you one application of tensors and statistics, but there's definitely plenty more, okay? And I'll Uh, in statistics, people like to reject some hypotheses. Yes. Uh, how do you reject the phylogenetic tree? Uh, you have the polynomial, you have the data. Okay. Uh, do you have a criterion for the data not to fit? Right, so this is actually one of the hard parts for applying these algebraic methods to um, these phylogenetic trees. So there's another project that I'm working on with biochemical reaction networks, and it's the same thing. You have models that are defined by sets of polynomials. And in that case, right, your data, you know, if you're assuming Gaussian noise on the data, you know that the your closest point, right, how you want to define closest is with the L2 norm, and you have a statistical reasoning for choosing that. In this case, this data, right, is, is sort of an estimate of the distribution, right? And so I actually don't know how I want to define closest point to the variety. And so this is actually one of the first questions that needs to be asked. Um, so actually when Marta Castanellis had did, um, 
Marta and Jesus did their exper experiments, how they defined close to the variety was they just plugged in their data points into the polynomials, and then they took the, abs you know, the sum of the absolute value of all, all the values that they got, right? And this actually performed very well. And I know that, um, the, um, I want to say Joe Rusinko and a student of Dan Bates, Brent Davis, had had looked at this in another context in these phylo, you know, fitting these phylogenetic trees, and they used the orthogonal projection, right, where I'm taking closest to point, meaning I'm minimizing the distance from the variety, and that wasn't working any better than the way that Marta and Jesus had done it. So, so this is this is a fundamental question. So, rejecting in this case, we don't know how to reject. The same setup in other cases, like with the biochemical reaction networks, we can we can describe explicitly when you reject. But in this case, no. Maybe I can make a remark. Ideally, we would like to compute a p-value, but we're very far from it. First of all, we'd like to use one of these equations as a test statistic, or the absolute value of a test statistic. But to even, but we need to know the distribution of the test statistic over the space of data to even set up a p-value calculation. So in principle, there's a methodology, but we don't know how to do the math. Exactly. We don't know how to do the exactly. Uh, can you explain better which kind of equation Marta Casanellas used? Uh, because uh, this analysis was before the equation. Uh, yes. Problem. Uh, were found, no, so right, this was. So they, there's some assumptions that you can make on those um, matrices. So in this general Markov model setting, the transition probability matrices, they can have any entries, and that just makes it the most general model. But if I put some symmetries on the, on the matrices, right? So these. So the matrices, the flattening matrix. Uh, no, the the transition probability matrices on. So, right. I have a matrix on each of these edges, right? That tells me the probability of trans. trans if I see, you know, A here, what's the probability I see A here? Well, I can make some simplifying assumptions on these matrices, right? I can have like all alphas along the diagonal and betas elsewhere. And when I make those, then it's much easier, and we understand the equations better. And so I don't know what particular model that they looked at, but they looked at one of these where you. Where it's not the full general, it's not the general setting as this one, but as it's a restricted know, setting. The new equation, it should be possible to make the same analysis with the general matrix, or I'm mistaken. Uh, uh, well, you repeat your question again. So it should be possible to repeat the analysis with the general four times uh, four. Yes, you you should be able to, but um, <coughs> yes, but in all, but uh, there's the problem of. Okay, even evaluating these polynomials is going to take time. I mean, you're asking to find the closest yeah. point in the variety in a 64 dimensional space. This is not trivial. Even if you knew all of the equations and everything, and even if the equations were reasonably nice, which these might not be, this is still a very difficult thing to do, even. Uh, yeah, but, but remember, Greg, great. Um, they, in Marta and Jesus's, they didn't use the closest point, they just evaluated the polynomials and saw how close that was to zero. So maybe in that method you could. Definitely with closest point, right, then I'm doing this minimization problem, right, where I have, a, yeah, a, a, this is a very unwieldy minimization problem that I wouldn't be able to solve, um, even I think with numerical methods. So if I, I don't know if I'm remembering right from mm -hmm. Marta's paper, uh, is this, uh, but isn't it possible <coughs> to just use a open set and so just take, Cody mentioned many random Linear combinations of these polynomials. In your, the yeah, you're probably right. With probability one, we're still on that variety, I guess, uh, if we're just an open set that contains a variety of the same dimension. You're right, and actually, um, this actually brings up another point, right? Because I'm being a little bit tricky here, because I'm saying that we actually need the full set of invariants, but actually, um, Marta Jesus actually showed you don't actually need the whole set of invariants. Um, you just need what are called the edge invariants. So that probably answers George's question. Maybe it's these degree five equations. Yeah. So let's thank Seth again. <laughs> <laughs>